Welcome to the Yale University Art Gallery. My name is Jesse Park, the Nina and Lee Griggs Assistant Curator of European Art. Today's program, in the form of a conversation, follows the virtual lecture entitled Close to Shore, Simone de Vlieger, The Beach, The Fishery, and Divine Favor, given by John Walsh. Before we begin our program, I would like to share that Yale University acknowledges indigenous peoples and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantuke Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Skadikok, Golden Hill Pogaset, Nihantik, and the Quinnipiac, and other Algonquin speaking peoples, all of whom have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We deeply honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. I would like to start this program with some introductions. A good number of our audience members may know John well, but for some, this lecture and e-conversation are maybe your first time hearing him speak. And I'm also new to the gallery. So John and I will be introducing each other. It is really my great pleasure and privilege to introduce John Walsh. John is a distinguished scholar of 17th century Dutch art, a remarkable curator, a riveting lecturer, and indefatigable, indefatigable um, advocate of the next generation of art historians, museum curators, and educators. He has long-standing connections to Yale. As a graduate of Yale College, class of 1961, and a visiting professor in the history of art department. Also, he has given over 40 public lectures at the gallery, where he continues to train the museum's world of gallery teachers. John also served extensively in the field of museums as a curator at the Frick Collection in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and as a director of the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles from 1983 to 2000. John, it's really wonderful to have you here. Jesse, thank you. Um, you, if I may introduce you right now, uh, came to Yale after three years as a curatorial fellow at the Fogg Museum at Harvard. And before that, I'm proud to say you were at the Getty Museum as an intern and a consultant in the drawings department. Jesse Park was and is a product of the University of California at Irvine and then at UC Riverside and uh, has her PhD from the University of Arizona. Um, she began as a specialist in the art of the Renaissance in Flanders um, and its role in dynastic and religious politics. And that's a field that requires a lot. You, you have to know prints and drawings and tapestries and sculpture, as well as paintings, as well as literature and languages. Um, I actually first came across Jesse's work in the marvelous Getty exhibition called Looking East, Rubens's Encounter with Asia. She's lectured and published on many different kinds of exchanges between the visual cultures of Europe and Southeast Asia. And she's helped several museum staffs become more alert to the impoverishing effects of their Eurocentric biases. Anyway, I can't do justice to your resume, Jesse, but I'm really glad that you're at Yale and I'm grateful to be talking to you. Well, thank you so much, Sean, for your very generous introduction. Um, so with that, we're going to um, show you the next slide because before we um, delve into our conversation, I want to inform our audience members that if anyone has questions for John regarding his lecture, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom window to ask your questions at any time. If you want to really engage in the conversation at any point in the program, please <coughs> click the chat button and share your thoughts with us. We'll do our best to include audience responses and questions in our conversation. I also want to inform our audience that our colleague at the gallery, John French, 
who is not visible on Zoom screen at the moment, is assisting us with images backstage. So let's begin our program um, by looking at this slide here. So John, in your lecture, you brilliantly situate the Yale de Vlieger painting within the history of marine painting in the Netherlands, particularly beach views. And by taking us through the social history of beaches, you provide an amazing overview of the evolution of the ways in which Europeans have connected with the sea over the course of a few centuries. And you conclude your lecture by showing us how artists working elsewhere in Europe and America in the following centuries appropriated the composition of Dutch beach views in a number of ways. So John, I would love to start a conversation by thinking about how the Dutch marine painting, which you've covered in your lecture on Simon de Vlieger, was a topic of your PhD dissertation. In your dissertation, which is really amazing work, uh, you wrote about the painters of Jan Percellus and his son Julius, who were, especially in the case of Jan, really critical to the development of Dutch marine painting in the 17th century. So can you share what aspect about Dutch marine painting appealed to you then and remains appealing to you to this day? Yeah, um, it didn't start that way. Uh, Dutch marine painting was not really on my radar. And I, was, I went off to Holland uh, as a graduate student to, to study humor in Dutch 17th century painting. My, my teacher had suggested that as a dissertation topic. And I got there and it didn't take me more than a few weeks to realize that was impossible. Uh, I had the language, but I didn't have the literary capacity and I didn't have the culture. I didn't, I couldn't do it. And so to, I went, I started going to museums thinking, ah, oh, this will wake me, this will, this will show me something. And at a certain point I saw paintings by this artist, by Jan Porcellis, somebody I knew about on in black and white on in pictures. And I, I um, was stunned by some things, several things. I mean, for one thing that these, the people who were being pictured in this are completely anonymous, would never know who they were. They were just working folk, either on the shore or out uh, on the water. Um, working against and with the elements both and the elements were being portrayed in these pictures. This is already 1620s we're talking about, early 1630s, portrayed with such a kind of vivid feeling for the, the smell, the look of the sky, the big, huge clouds, um, and the proportions had changed in landscape. Suddenly, Porcellus was giving you two, three times as much sky as land or water. So I thought, oh, whoa, this is, um, this is radical. How radical, I didn't really realize. Actually, we've got a, a, another image, the next one. Um, uh, next one after that. Um, this, is, this is Porcellus in 1630. You can hardly imagine uh, any other artist in any other country doing anything like this. Um, color is almost gone. And, um, and what you've got is the action of the sea, the wind, uh, and these vast beautiful, amazing clouds uh, in a picture that's close to monochrome. And I knew this was something going on in still life and genre painting and other, but this, this, this move towards a, a kind of um, uh, 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 leached out, but paint in terms of paint, very, very active surface. It was just amazing. And of course, I was reacting that way because I'd come to this from Impressionism. This looked to me like, I don't know, uh, like Pizarro or, or, or Monet or something like that. Uh, and so I thought, whoa, this is, this, is a, 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 this is an artist now obscure who brought about something enormous. And one thing he brought about was this teaching of this artist uh, Simon de Flieger, who expanded the possibilities uh, of what Porcellus had, had taught. That's really fascinating to hear, John. Um, I think that just kind of takes me straight back to my dissertation <laughs> research yeah. writing days. Um, I think it's, there's a kind of, there isn't sort of like a no straight path, really, to kind of <laughs> 
take us through um, from start to finish when it comes to figuring out what you want to actually write about, what you're passionate about. And once you sort of figure out your dissertation yeah. topic that you really love, that sort of becomes like a platform really um, yeah. from which you kind of think about your career, your next steps. So it's really fascinating to hear sort of the, the journey that you took um, yeah. to kind of uh, to get to your work on Purcellus. It's really fascinating. It it's kind of interesting diagnostically because what got me going was the work of art in front of me in the original lots of them as it turns out then i got into a sort of treasure hunt of trying to find them all over europe actually the you know in the hague there's this wonderful library that uh, and uh, art study center for art which has pictures black and white photographs of literally millions of Dutch paintings Dutch and Flemish paintings and so you at least get a clue as to where things might be or might have been, and you can trace them down, which we did. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's absolutely, yeah. It's, I think that's just part of the whole process when you're doing dissertation research <laughs> or any sort of any scholarly research, I think. Um, so, uh, so I would love to actually go back to uh, slide number three, um, because so given kind of thinking about your background in this material, John, I can imagine yeah. just how exciting uh, you were when the gallery acquired this painting by Fleher. And for me, when I first saw this painting in person, I thought this was really a painting of high quality. I mean, the brushwork is absolutely superb. You know, there's this incredible meticulous application of paint to kind of really delineate different surfaces. And, you know, I think painting itself, this painting, it's actually really, it's quite large. It's 32 by 52 inches. Very big. It is very big, very big. And, yeah, and it looks even bigger in its frame. Yeah. Um, and there's incredible spatial depth. There's a um, the wonderful still life of fish in the foreground. Um, and there's sort of what I see is something like class distinctions, if you will. You see some <laughs> yeah. well-dressed man on the horseback on the far left next to, you know, humbly dressed fishermen, etc. So there's just so much to see in such a simplistic, relatively simplistic composition. So. Like, what about you, John? What was really your initial response to this painting? And what aspects of it caught your attention upon your first encounter with it? In general, just like you, I, I mean, it was, it's huge. It's, it's you know, four and a half feet wide, this picture. Um, and uh, as you say, it shows, it, 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 he's extremely skillful as a painter with the minimum amount of brushwork. You get the figure, you get the, the cod on the beach or the, or, or, or the little carriage full of people on the right side. So I love that part, but, but what hit me was two things. Um, it, it, he, he uses a device uh, in the sky that is unusual. I don't know that he uses it in another picture, which is to paint one of those great puffy sky, skies that comes actually up over your head, seems to anyway, and darkens over your head. And that seems to cast a kind of darkening, has a darkening effect on the whole rest of the picture. Um, you can see shadow and, and light, but it's in general rather dimmer. It's almost a dour view of the, of, of the beach. And that seems to suit what's going on here. What you're seeing is work, work, people at work, all the way from the guys in the foreground uh, peddling fish, all the way through that very curious and I think unique lineup of fishing pinks that goes way out to the horizon. And well, at the horizon is a big three-master sailing ship. It seemed to me there's something so purposeful about that long diagonal going way deep into space. And not just, you know, the aesthetic pleasure of it evoking empty space and, and distance that it does that but there seemed to be something else going on these the maneuvers of these boats which i go into as in the lecture a bit and we'll come back to i think sure yes yeah, so i think it'd be great if we can see slide number 34 um because kind of thinking about what you said john i what i find really interesting if not striking about our yale painting is that it's so different from other beach scenes by the fleeher i mean yeah. it offers this incredible panoramic view of the beach, but it's not really depicted from a certain angle. Um, yeah. So if we kind of think about um, this whole space being almost like a stage, 
it re, to me it kind of recalls compositions like the view of Amsterdam festive procession for Marie de Medici that De Vlieger designed. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what are your thoughts on this? And do you think this painting would have been commissioned? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I, I can't find another explanation for this composition. Um, you, by the way, you're not uh, uh, um, you're not up high as other beach pictures are by Flieger. You're down on the sand yourself, standing there, and um, you uh, you have the kind of panoramic view that you have the, of Amsterdam uh, on the right. But like the picture celebrating the procession of Maria de Medici in Amsterdam. You've got a composition used for a purpose here. Um, that diagonal into the far distance that I was describing it just a second ago. And it's so eccentric um, and it's so specific that I think it probably was painted for somebody who knew a lot about fishing for whom the, these beach, what went on on the beach every day was, was absolutely uh, familiar not just the sails going on at the left-hand side, but particularly the maneuvers of the boats as you they move back. Um, and that's that's a quite specific series of actions that reveals something about the organization of the little herring fleets that occupied the same bits of beach at the fishing towns along the North Sea beaches. They couldn't all come to shore at once. They all launched at the same time, high tide, because after all, they were up on the beach on rollers. High tide launched, they all left together whatever day of night, time of day or night it was. You only see daytime, of course, in Dutch landscape painting, but, but, but at, at any time of day or night, they would go out and they would fish along shore, uh, not terribly far off, and come back at high tide all together. They couldn't, and the, the merchants, the buyers of the fish, gathered there, they knew exactly when, because they had tide tables too. Um, and and the, but the, these guys couldn't come to shore all at once and make a melee out of it, as my friend Larry Cantor said, as they would have done in Italy. <laughs> but they were orderly about it. They gave way to each other. They, they made, they sacrificed a certain amount of the chance that they would not sell their catch by backing off and sailing around, actually killing time and coming ashore in a kind of landing pattern, almost like an airport. And that's what these do. And boats are jockeying around out there waiting to come to shore. Yeah, you can see yeah, a little better waiting to come to shore and doing some fancy stuff uh, to, uh, to, to stall. Uh, so you've got a wonderful procession uh, that ends on the left-hand side, catches now going to be loaded onto uh, whatever these horses were pulling, a, a, a wagon that you can't see. Uh, and uh, others are waiting to uh, receive the boats that were coming. One of them is just landing in the shore, uh, in the in the shallow water, as you can see, and the roller is being brought and all this stuff. So it, it's, um, it's a picture that's so purposeful in its content and its organization that I'm pretty convinced it was painted for somebody who was in the business or profited from the business in some way and would enjoy having the picture in the house to show not just that here's what they do, here's what those clever fishermen do, um, but also to illustrate, and it's a point I try to make in the lecture, illustrate that this is a virtue. This is a virtue that's hardwired into the Dutch mentality about prosperity, that it depends not on rugged individualism as much as it depends on a kind of coordinated, agreed to uh, restraint, let's just say. Um, and in that comes strength. There's a, a Dutch motto, uh, in unity, there is strength. So anyway, that's my theory. Someone may kill that theory, maybe stretching it too far, but that's what I see in the picture. And this is not, in other words, a picture that would have been bought off the wall by somebody who was amused by it. Uh, this is a picture, I think, that where the artist went to considerable expense and labor to produce something, I think, quite specifically targeted. That's really amazing to hear, John. Um, thank you so much for your insight on that. 
Um, I think what you were talking about, uh, kind of level of specificity, the purposefulness, the intentionality behind this painting, the production of it, I think there's a really great question from the audience uh, member who's asking, uh, why would, given just really kind of the meticulousness of the painting, why would the artist not completely paint out the feet, the dogs, um, which you talk about in the lecture, so that they oh, yeah. would completely disappear? I, I, it's, it's a very good question. Um, why that area, uh, it looks the way it does. Uh, I, I, I can't really answer the question why that area is dark. There is a, uh, you may remember that part from the lecture over on the far left. Um, there's a kind of messy area just to the, between the figures. Ah, brilliant, there you go. Kind of uh, uh, as, uh, why, since he's so meticulous painting the figures and the boats, then they do a better job of getting rid of the dog that he didn't need or the human being he didn't need. I make the point in the lecture that there's somebody where the infrared at the right shows you that there isn't the bottom part of the legs of a man who's also been removed or maybe never even completed wearing boots. You can see the boots from the back. I can't answer the question of why this is um, now visible as easily as it is, if only as a kind of messed up area. He wanted a void between the two, a space between the two groups of fisher folk. Uh, but he probably could have done a nicer job. Yeah, it's all really fascinating if you look at this painting. Um, and I think I kind of want to kind of go back to one of the things that you mentioned earlier in, in your response about clouds. And yeah. you wrote this wonderful essay, I highly recommend our audience to read it if you can, um, called Skies and Reality in Dutch Landscape, in which you discuss the ways in which clouds are depicted in Dutch paintings as really kind of this pictorial devices, and how depictions of weather conditions impact the composition, the structure, the viewers reading of landscapes and seascapes. Um, so, uh, in the case of you know this painting here, uh, what roles may De Fleeter's rendering of the sky kind of play in the beach scene, um, and how might the way he depicted the sky here have really influenced a 17th century viewer's engagement with the painting? And I'm aware that you sort of uh, talked about that, but I would love for you to kind of unpack that a little bit more. Yeah, that's that's that is that is a, that is a good question, and it bears coming back to. Um, the sky um, here is a rain. By the way, this is not sky that's been observed in nature uh, in drawings or let alone the kind of sketches done by John Constable and the German and Danish painters. Uh, you know, the Dutch painters did not go out and make paintings of the sky out of doors. In fact, they didn't make anything out of doors. They painted indoors in their studios from a combination of recollection of the real look of clouds and using formulas. Um, actually, you could see quite a lot along the Dutch uh, shore, um, but you would never see anything that looked quite like this, just uh, to be um, a little bit uh, forensic about it. Um, a meteorologist looking over our shoulder here at the painting would see that there's out on above the horizon, just above the horizon, a kind of wavy line of clouds. Uh, clouds don't do that. Um, clouds have flat bases. These particular kinds of clouds have flat bases. And they're very rarely combined. Well, nope, that's the right, wrong direction. I think we better get the whole picture uh, back again. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and they are rarely combined in the way they are here with this big puffy white one just to the left of center. Um, uh, that's a cloud of a type that is created by the up rush of warm air. Um, and um, so that the, the physics of the clouds here is ignored in favor of a kind of more rhythmical uh, 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 variation that gives variety to the image uh, of the bo boats coming ashore. Um, and over on top, something really quite extraordinary happens. The painter lets a lot of panel tone, that means the brownish reddish uh, preparatory layer 
uh, strike through the gray that he's put on top to create this looming gray dark, dark cloud, which suggests the possibility of rain. But it also casts its shadow down on the ground so that what you get on the sand here is a kind of muffled effect of light and shade. I mean, it is very active. And yet we're so used to looking at skies and clouds in real life and in other paintings, we we don't quite, I don't think we see the artifice here. Um, it's not false, but, but, but it's not true to, to science, let's say. And you can see lots of other examples in other pictures by the Flieger. If you want, if you watch the video lecture again, you'll get caught up by a, in a critique of the clouds. Yeah, speaking of, you know, artifice and sky, um, John, in your lecture, you talk about uh, the Flieger getting his start as a marine painter by, you know, depicting seascapes conceived with a really yeah. kind of low vantage point about yeah. you know, literally two thirds of the painting devoted to sky and clouds yeah. and, you know, the subtleties of the weather and the moves of the sea. Yeah, you'd have to be in a boat to see what we're seeing here, particularly in the Porcellus on the, on the right hand side, you'd have to, you, you, that's not a, a view you can take from the beach uh, on shore looking all out. You have to be in a vessel uh, in that nasty choppy water, but what's on top, what's above and what's behaving a little like the boats uh, are these enormous diagonal clouds. Um, these two are, largely invented, um, uh, those clouds should, should lay flatter, but, but they wouldn't be able to do the work they do here, which is to accentuate the force of the wind on these two, two boats. It's a struggle. These boats have both too much sail up <laughs> and uh, it's, 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 un it's uncomfortable on board. And you notice that there's no land. You can't see a thing on the horizon. You just see one shadowy boat. De Flieger gave you more to look at. If this is by De Flieger, and I think it may well be an early, early work by De Flieger on the left, um, there's a more of a mix of vessels and a little less high drama going on. Right. So all of these things kind of, you know, makes me think that, you know, these kind of choice, I feel like, is um, kind of not conceived that random, really, but really kind of by some sort of like informed decision. Um, so it seems to me that, that De, De Vlieger found his you know, sort of position in the Dutch art market by kind of mastering the way he depicted, sh you know, ships, the waves, like you said, the calm ones, the choppy ones, these immense clouds and these figures. Um, so this, all of these things together makes me think about the studies on the Dutch art market um, yeah. by scholars, including, you know, John Montius, you know, Jan de Vries, Eric Jan Slaughter, etc. So from your perspective, John, what do the Fleeher's works um, tell us about the art market, as well as the taste of consumers in the 17th century Dutch Republic? Right. Well, um, you know, and De Vlieger, De Vlieger not only painted fair weather sailing uh, conditions, but he painted desperate storms, the most dramatic, uh, histrionic, even crack ups of major vessels on rocky shores and the like. So there, there were categories within categories, seascape being the larger one. And then you've got shipwrecks, beaches, you've got parade pictures, which you saw in the lecture, some of you, um, where you've got masses of boats in a calm, uh, boats and ships in a calm uh, uh, anchorage uh, or on a river. So there are categories and the artists painted pictures that fit within those categories and rarely invented much outside those categories. Uh, the, the number of one-off compositions is, is relatively small compared to those that fit the categories. And that speaks to a kind of market segmentation, I guess you could call it, which, and, and the size and material of the paintings varies a good deal. Some are quite small, like the two on the screen, but some are enormous. Um, and some, everything in between, and some on panel, which is typical uh, of uh, painting um, uh, of an earlier time. The De Flieger, for example, in Russia is 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 on a panel, but the 
Porcellus here at Yale, which you see on the on the screen, is on canvas a bit a bit surprisingly. Um, and um, the big the big new De Vlieger we'll talk about maybe if we get time. Um, there was bring foreign visitors to Amsterdam or, or, or to Holland generally during the 17th century were always surprised to note that the pictures were not owned only by people in grand houses on the Heerengracht. They were owned by the peddlers, the shoemakers and small people who had only a few guilders to spend. Um, pictures were everywhere. And, and so, um, and the demand side, in other words, was 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 very was very great, and so it's not surprising that there could be so many different kinds of pictures. And yet, categories counted uh, because you didn't want to paint something that was so unfamiliar that it wouldn't sell, particularly to people who were not particularly sophisticated connoisseurs, of which there were lots. Yeah, so when you when you're talking about these, um, how massive the Dutch art market um, really is, because so many people actually was able to acquire works of art. I think I'm th kind of thinking about sort of this incredible high number of paintings that were produced in the 17th and 18th century. I think it was something along the lines of like five to ten million paintings that were produced, yeah. which is yeah. extraordinary. Yeah, this is wonderful. A, a Yale economist called John Michael Montias, you mentioned him, Jesse. Um, was really the first person we know of anyway in modern times to go at the numbers <laughs> that could be gotten out of inventories and other uh, evidences of works of art by their artists and their um, artists and their uh, 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 the owners. Um, and the, if, if this is an interest of anybody, uh, it's well worth your getting anything by uh, Michael Montius. Um, but yes, there were millions of paintings produced. There were thousands of artists. And, um, and, and, and a good many were exported, but mostly they were, I think, bought for domestic consumption. Right, so I think I think that makes me kind of think about these different players, um, you know, in the Dutch art market. I think about um, you know potential dealers, you know, you know guilds, even the artists themselves. I think they were collectors. So can you kind of tell us a little bit more about the sort of the landscape of the Dutch art market and the players that played players um, of that scene? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, another another point, of course, is that there weren't art galleries. Where you could go shopping, uh, dealers who showed stuff on the wall. Yeah, there were a few dealers. Rembrandt, for example, had as a sort of partner and kind of de dealer, Hendrik van Arlenburg. Um, and undoubtedly, if you came to see Arlenburg, he would see paintings by the few artists that he had. So, but not in any great gallery form. They were just around. Mostly, if you were shopping for a work of art, you would kind of know what. A particular artist, you might have run into the uh, paintings by a, a given artist or subject, and somebody would tell you, "Oh, yeah, you should go see De Flieger. Um, he paints nice beaches, and they come in all sizes." Whatever the uh, conversation, you would go and look at Simon De Flieger's studio, and he would show you. We hear somebody would show you what there was, um, and. Um, there were always some extra, no doubt, um, that you could buy from the artist directly. From time to time, there were art fairs, not what we mean now by, you know, warehouses full, but but sm small fairs, kermesse, and so forth, at which dealers, uh, people with paintings would set up stalls. So the art market was a very one-to-one -one thing. You went and saw the artist and bought from him, or if the artists were lucky, you'd commission something for him. So a well-to-do fish dealer or whatever, I'm just making that up, but a well-to-do person who'd invested in uh, boats uh, to do the longshore fishing um, might come along to be introduced to Simon the Flieger and might say, ah, I want a big one like that, but I want, I want, that, I want the fleet to... Mm -hmm. So the compositions might well be affected by, if not dictated by the artist's client um, as against originated by the artist himself. 
Yeah, this is just really, really fascinating. Kind of thinking about the kinds of conversations and the transactions that you know took place um, in the 17th century Dutch Republic. I could just only imagine how how um, you know vibrant that really was. Um, and, and kind of thinking about the art market, it, 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 I, I'm kind of coming back to the point about point that you made in your lecture about um, you know the Fleeter's versatility, um, as well as a really a variety of subject matter he portrayed. You know, we see that you know the Fleeter was not just a marine painter. He you know he worked on other types of works, you know, such as uh, you know designs for procession, which we saw earlier. He even yeah. signed stained glass windows, tapestries, and you know he painted organ shutters, um, and even portrayed all different kinds of subjects. You know, like for example, in size of the here, um, including these finished drawings of you know trees, you know buildings, and you know he also showed some images of animals. Uh, in the case of the two greyhounds here, um, so I think even in the area of marine paintings, uh, he depicted a relatively sort of open beach scene of socio like economically underserved people and crowded pictures with large ships owned by the wealthy. Um, this is kind of like a, I'm incorporating one of the questions from the audience too here. Yeah. Um, and so I think one, it's one thing to talk about the kinds of constituents he catered to, but um, I think it's also another thing to consider his artistic output sort of more holistically. Um, so in your opinion, John, how might his works across media and subject matter have informed each other? It's, it's a good question. Apart from the technical matters of etching and uh, producing drawings for engraving and the like, um, I think, I have to say, I think he was a, a complete opportunist I say that in a, in a neutral way, not as criticism. I think he took advantage of the existence of quite a number of opportunities to work in different media. Um, there were collectors of finished drawings that could be kept in portfolios and shown or framed. That's what the picture on the very left side of this slide shows. Um, there were print collectors and increasing numbers and prints didn't cost very much. And you could compile quite a collection um, of views, uh, landscapes, um, uh, not so much seascapes, but landscapes uh, and um, peasant activities of all kinds, um, farm animals, dogs like greyhounds, which are a higher grade of dog would have been owned by people who took them out riding. And um, you might even be versatile enough, and this is very rare, uh, to be able to paint a decent portrait. And if you did, uh, you might have a sitter for the portrait, like the one in the middle, who was vain enough, um, or somebody was vain enough to commission an engraving. That's a lot of work to make an engraving, and you can print a good many of them and sell them. This is probably advertising for Jacob Colon's uh, business, which was to be an, a, 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 a bookseller and a, a, a creator of, of books um, dealing largely with navigation, which gives him a link uh, to Seaman de Flieger. And de Flieger um, did something quite uncharacteristic in a portrait like this. Um, not only is it not a landscape, but it's a seascape alluding to uh, Colomb's um, market for his work, which was people who had to navigate for thousands of miles, and he had, uh, there were maps in his books and the like. Uh, he got a sea painter, not just to paint, paint his portrait, but to paint a wonderful background under a big cloud, two big sailing ships. Anyway, I think he did the work that was going to prove profitable, or that his clients asked him to do, or both. That's really interesting, John. I think this is a really good point to kind of incorporate a couple of questions from the audience. Yeah. Um, so one is uh, so one is about um, the kind of the process, uh, Du Fleeter's process in um, kind of portraying these beach scenes. So um, yeah. I think one kind of the curiosity is the one kind of aspect of his process that's really interesting. I think to a number of our audience members here is is how he, the kind of 
how what were how how did he was how was he able to actually kind of um portray these sort of naturalistic depiction like naturalistic depictions of you know figures animals and different kind of scenery without um kind of any any other reference other than their own memory kind of thinking from their own memory and yeah. also about how there were these kind of use of preparatory drawings by the um the flea her kind of speaks to how he worked out his compositions directly, whether that be on um, on canvas or panel. Yeah, yeah. Um, you could actually go back to number three, um, the whole painting. Yeah, great. Um, well, uh, he, he did make drawings, studies of uh, fisher folk. So he, he had a bunch of, uh, had a repertory, let's say. Um, he was also quite capable, having done so much drawing, um, of creating figures more or less out of his head and figure groups. And he actually did an etching of that uh, similar uh, kind of group of peasants just, just sitting around on the sand doing what they do. Um, as it comes to constructing the picture itself, he starts, in this case, with a, with a great big panel um, and he covers it with a kind of uh, what we would think of as a sort of washy grounding and builds up um, to a point where he then <clears throat> can uh, draw, I think, with the point of the brush, um, the composition, lay it out, um, and then bring it up, working very likely back to front. Um, so it's, I don't think he's in any way novel as uh, in, in terms of technique. He's just really good at it. And he could probably make a good many changes um, and paint them out um, and did that from time to time, as you saw uh, on the, at the left. Um, I'm not sure I really answered the question, Jesse. What do you, what do you think? Have you got more, more to add about how the Flieger worked? I think, John, I think it's, I think working from preparatory drawings are probably the best indicators uh, yeah. when it comes to understanding, especially landscape paintings and sandscapes or seascape yeah. paintings in general. So I agree with you. But there's no compositional study. In other words, there's no, he didn't, uh, he didn't go through a series of processes. Um, this is not like the Ruben studio where, where you work up in stages. I think the thing was probably laid out a la prima, uh, on the panel um, in, 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 a, in a brush underdrawing and then developed uh, area by area. Right, I agree. Um, I think there's another question from the audience um, that we could kind of think about since we're on this slide. Um, uh, the, so the question is, is it unusual to mix a genre scene of ordinary folk on a seashore with depictions of maritime power and glory? <laughs> uh, I think I didn't quite get the end. Is it normal to paint fisher folk on the beach? But what about the it, power? power right, I think the question is like if it's whether or not it's unusual to show a genre scene, um, have have a genre scene with you know ordinary folks engaging in either these type of activities of fishing, as well as um, mixing that with the sort of the depictions of maritime power and glory that we see at the um, the arm of the man the far back. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, we had that slide with all four beach scenes on it. Uh, we might bring that back if John can manage that. Um, uh, yeah, it varied. I, I I can't say what the impulse was. Uh, was it a, an autonomous impulse on the part of the artist to uh, to paint what he felt like painting that day, um, or was it uh, a calculation that, um, yeah, thank you, um, calculation that, well, uh, for these people, for my intended buyer, whoever it was, either general or, 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 or specific, let's say at the lower left, um, I'm going to give them the works. I'm going to give them the works. I'm going to give them everything. I'm even going to include Admiral Trump's flagship um, on the uh, on the left with a bunch of people looking at it from the beach and I'm going to give them lots and lots more boats as far out as you can see there are ships but there are also fishermen going about their work as though there were nothing else happening and people coming ashore from other larger ships um, 
there's a whole range of activity there uh, and seen from a, a sort of distant uh, raised point of view, creating a kind of great panorama of the life of the beach and the sea. Um, at the other extreme, it can be pure fishing uh, and the, the, the humblest part of pure fishing in the Yale picture up at the upper left, or some, some combination on uh, the picture on the upper right um, has some one biggish ship in the far, far left, but kind of upstaged by the fishermen um, coming in on, uh, on the water and then those already on the beach. And, and then the very distinctive and very detailed scene of the display of the cod and other fish and the milling group of fishermen and even a buyer uh, they're here standing looking out to sea. He, he did a whole variety, it's a mix. Um, the Yale picture is on the workaday end and has only one big three-masted ship. And I, you know, I think it's there to remind somebody that there is a, a larger world of commerce. Um, uh, and this is, you could say, a kind of extension of it. This is a stretch, but all these fishing pinks, sort of, as it were, pointing in the direction of this big ship who's got bigger things to, uh, we're gonna say bigger fish to fry, but bigger bigger things to do in the world. Um, it's a kind of, I think, a little, little footnote that, oh, by the way, um, we are active throughout the world with bigger ships than the little ones you're seeing in the foreground. Um, that's a long-winded answer and may not even have answered the question. John, I think I, I love your comment about sort of these elements as a footnote to kind of talk about possibly a bigger, um, you know, yeah. uh, bigger happenings that are not really being depicted in, you know, marine paintings. So I think, I think this is a really good point for us to think about uh, um, how when we how typically when we look at Dutch paintings in general, Dutch marine paintings in general, we we look look at them through the lens of economic success, you know, through you know naval prowess, the maritime trade, you know, the herring fish fisheries called the Great Fisher, which you talked about in your lecture, which was really fascinating. Um, and so I'm I'm kind of thinking about how these elements and. Um, these type of um, interpretation of Dutch marine painting is um, maybe um, not allowing us to think about uh, further implications behind it. Because um, to me, when I look at especially the detail of, you know, the still lives, uh, the still life detail in the foreground of our painting with this mm -hmm. little fish on the call, the herring and some flatfish there, um, kind of pushing them to the very forefront to the picture plane. I think about not just sort of these uh, local goods um, that the Dutch traded, but even just uh, kind of expanding that a little bit further to think about, you know, the global trade goods, for example. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, I think this might be a really good um, place to kind of, uh, for you to maybe tell us a little bit more about um, the Dutch trade in, um, in a sort of a giving a more of a complicated picture of the Dutch trade yeah. and how you know, the prosperity that the trade has brought to the Republic wasn't just because of these, just because of the trade itself, the, the, the Dutch merchantmen, the, um, those who are on voyage to um, engaging in these activities, but really uh, by slave trade and the use of enslaved labor across really various locations around the world. Um, so I think it, this will be a really good um, time for you to maybe kind of expand a little bit more because I remember that you didn't have enough time to expand on this in your lecture. Um, so it'd be, it'd be great if you can kind of tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah, gladly. I, I, I gave an awful lot of time to herring, <laughs> the herring fishery in the North Sea um, and elsewhere, uh, which was a huge trade item for sure. Um, uh, the Dutch made their money partly by taking in raw products, making something much more expensive out of them. And then I'm thinking now about herring, but I'm also thinking about sugar. And when I think about sugar, uh, I think about um, the triangle trade and uh, it's just a good thing, even though we don't see anything happening in the pictures that I've shown, it's a good thing to remember uh, that the Dutch shipped large amounts of manufactured goods, such as they were, or raw materials that could not be had in Africa 
down the coast to ports that they had established by kicking the Portuguese out of the African coasts and unloading their cargo um, and loading it up again with human cargo, with literally hundreds, as many as four or 500 enslaved people, people who had been rounded up, uh, turned in by their tribal leaders or, or, or hunted down um, by white people. And uh, slavery was the commodity, not only that enriched the traders on the coast of Africa, but allowed traffic across the Atlantic to the Dutch colonies in modern day Brazil and the Caribbean, what has become Suriname and Curaçao and a whole archipelago of islands in the Caribbean, all of which were made their money raising and selling sugar. And sugar is very labor intensive and the Portuguese were always short of labor, as were the Dutch when they took over the Portuguese colonies. And, and so the Dutch became slave traders and slave merchants and, and imported them in amazingly large, amazingly large numbers, as many as 30,000 just during the period we're talking about, and many, many more. Uh, during the course of the 17th and uh, the rest of the 17th and the 18th century and into the middle of the 19th century. From Brazil, uh, from the work done by these enslaved people in the Brazilian uh, sugar plantations, uh, and uh, the Dutch ships transported mainly sugar, but also coffee and other uh, commodities um, to Holland. And they were further processed, that is the sugar, uh, in Holland and then sold, as I said, at much greater expense uh, to, the, to the, any who would buy. Anyway, that's just, and that's just the Atlantic slave trade. In the South Seas, um, in particularly the archipelago of between Indonesia and modern Papua New Guinea, New Guinea uh, there was the infamous Banda Island uh, ca captured by the Dutch in 1621 uh, it was. Um, and of the 15,000 native inhabitants, 14,000 were killed by the Dutch to establish a trading colony there and also a place where nutmeg and mace and cloves and other very expensive spices could be grown and exported. And the Dutch were in, in ships, like the ones, some of the ones we've seen, um, and the ones done by this non-artist non uh, man called Hans Profeet uh, on the screen. Uh, ships traveled among the islands and up into the trading colony that the Dutch had established in, um, uh, in India, in, uh, in Bengal, and Bengalese slaves, slave people from all kinds of places in, in the sort of Ganges region were shipped uh, as captives uh, to work uh, all kinds of jobs throughout the productive part of the Spice Islands. Uh, so the Dutch had a carrying trade that was very important to its economy and a commodity. Um, the Atlantic commodity was much the largest, but the South Sea uh, commodity um, was also important. And altogether, the Dutch have come now to coming to reckon finally with what they have not seen as uh, over the horizon, as it's called sometimes. Interesting, interesting that our Pentagon now talks about that as, 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 as drone warfare, stuff that, no, that we don't see. Um, the Dutch now are exploring not only the extent of the slave trade, but extent, uh, trying to understand how if this was understood in the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries. Was there, was there any substantial abolitionist 
uh, who, 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 who would that be? Were there pastors of churches inveighing against this as they were doing in England and the United States? What, what, to what extent was the Dutch public, which was or at least some part of which was enriched uh, by this trade, and to what extent were they aware and complicit? Um, there is an amazing exhibition on the subject. Now, I'm able to talk a, a little more fluently about the subject, which I don't truly know very much about. It's an exhibition at the Rijksmuseum. Here is the catalog. It's in print. And I think we might be able to give you the website, web address of a way to get a catalog. Ah, it's, there you go. Look in your chat and you will find it. Um, this is a, an extraordinary exhibition for an art museum that has contented itself mainly with showing works of art of its own country. Um, an amazing exhibition devoted to the entire activity of slavery as it affected the, the Netherlands uh, right up to the present day. And that means affected the descendants of, of slaves, slaves and slave owners uh, throughout the whole old Dutch world. So nowadays it's it's hard to look at a mass a picture of a mass uh, of Dutch seagoing vessels and paint paintings in the 17th century without thinking ah and imagining what what we're not seeing. Painters showed a little of it, but not enough. Right. And mostly, sorry, Jesse, say it again. No, no, I what you were just saying. Um, you know, I think it's a great. Uh, segue to the kind of quickly to point out, you know, Dirk Valkenberg that we're seeing on the screen on the left, um, who actually traveled um, to Suriname, or I think in even the next slide, um, yeah. we're looking at, you know, images by Franz Post, um, who actually also uh, traveled to Dutch Brazil. Yeah, this is a picture you can see at the Met, um, and it shows a beautiful, beautiful landscape and what looked like quite happy uh, indigenous people. Um, um, the Dutch, however, um, uh, inherited these people uh, from the Portuguese. Uh, they Portuguese had enslaved them, and the Dutch were perfectly happy to have the labor. Um, and um, the slaves from Africa, um, enslaved people, were worked the mills that processed the sugar cane as it came in. Now you can see at the up, upper left in the woodcut uh, a man. Uh, with uh, a bundle of cane, which is being uh, being um, uh, gr ground in a, in a mill, that the, the product of which you see at the right, a little more automated by by a by a, by a water powered wheel. This is this is producing the product that went aboard the ships that went back uh, to the Netherlands. Um, it was not easy work, and the conditions were at times beyond disgraceful um, and slavery is slavery and you are a property uh, and your family can be broken up at will. Anyway, not to belabor the, the, the terrible realities of the slave trade and what it took uh, to produce this huge contribution to Dutch prosperity back in Europe. Um, so I think I think we only have a couple more minutes until we conclude the program. Um, I think there's just one really quick question I wanted to um, ask you, John, before we close. Yeah. So since we're talking about the level of you know um, economic um, quote unquote prosper um, uh, success that um, the slave trade um, and the use of um, enslaved labor brought to the Netherlands, um, I think that kind of makes me think about the uh, make me think about um, the, the issues of you know disposable income. A lot of collectors had, and so the question from the audience um, was: Do we know who these people with disposable income were? Can you maybe just spend a couple seconds just talking about that? Yeah, we we know a lot. We know a lot of names because these some of the shareholders in the two <laughs> two monopoly companies that controlled the Atlantic trade and the South Pacific trade. Uh, these were these were the the the, the governors of the, well, the trustees, you could say, or the board of governors of these two hugely profitable companies. Well, huge, variably profitable, but in the best of times, enormously enriching. And these were people who had a stake, in other words, in the the, the East Indian Company and the West Indian Company. 
but there were also ship owners and who profited um, um, in, in a different way. There are also ship owners who, who profited, as I say, not just by import export, but by the carrying trade, by moving around among the various ports in the South Pacific in particular, uh, and collecting every time they delivered and every time they loaded up again. So yes, we know some names, sure, uh, and um, and they cannot have failed to know um, where what the labor force was that produced what came off the ships when they arrived in Holland. Great, thank you so much, John, uh, for answering that question. So now actually we're coming to the very end of the hour. Um, so thank you so much, Sean, for this wonderful, really enriching discussion and your great lecture on our de Vlieger painting. And then I would also like to thank our wonderful um, audience for participating in the conversation and asking really great questions. Um, I thank my colleagues at the gallery, Molly and Theodore, Liz Harnett, John French, and Guy Ortoleva for really making the lecture and today's virtual conversation possible. Um, so as John mentioned at the end of his lecture, the painting is on display in the European art galleries on the second floor of the gallery. So if you're able, I encourage um, all of our audience members to come and see the painting in person. So with that, um, we look forward to seeing you again at our um, upcoming events. Bye now.